In the deep sea, you're not on the ground just because you stopped sinking. Peacetime is hard times for Mercers like me. I used to be grateful for every job, no matter how boring or senseless it was. It's part of my routine to provide protection for supply boats and transports. It was my job to guard a sulfur shipment heading from the Gulf of Bengal to the Argentine Basin. Now, sulfur isn't a particularly attractive prize for pirates or anarchists. So I got to wondering why a protective convoy was necessary, especially since there'd been few pirate attacks recently. The captain of the transporter insisted on taking the slalom route through the Malay archipelago, crossing the South Pacific so as to round Cape Horn. I thought maybe he wanted to give himself and the crew a little entertainment in the pleasure domes of the Malay archipelago. A few oars, some surface simulation, who knows? I had nothing against the idea. We passed south of the domes and headed straight for the South Pacific Basin. They came at us from every direction. A torpedo exploding close off my bow jolted me from my daydreams. A small fleet of fighter boats under the flag of the Shogun encircled us. It probably wasn't monarchists, just bandits from the tornado zone. As a greeting, they sent us a flash shark, which penetrated the outer wall of the freighter and knocked out its electrical system. A hungry swarm of bull sharks was after me. It's no fun in a fix like that if you've only got a dilapidated boat with one firing tower. The automatic finder picked out the approaching torpedoes and sent them to the bottom one after the other, while the only thing I could do was fire a few feeble thresher sharks against the agile boats. Then three things happened at once. My location system failed, an explosion astern set my boat rolling, and a smart shogun bomber flashing painted teeth appeared, hovering right in front of me. I might have known that she was behind it all. My own personal nightmare from the depths of the tornado zone. I closed the valves on my suit, crawled into the escape hatch, and angrily jettisoned my lifeboat with a blast of compressed air. And not a second too soon, my crippled boat rolled over and sank into darkness as the grinning bomber strafed my titanium capsule with a salvo of hard case shot. One glance at the freighter confirmed what I feared. Two enemy boats had docked on. The crew was being dealt with already. Before I passed out, I thought of my failure, and I wondered why the hell the anarchists needed sulfur so bad. I came to, freezing on a cold metal floor, and I didn't know which was sharper, the features of the woman or the blade of the knife she threatened me with. She was a Russo-Japanese named Kung Lung, which means Red Dragon. A long time ago, in a penal colony in the Sea of Okhotsk, I slept with her. But at that moment, feelings of nostalgia stayed deep. She was the enemy, always had been. I defeated her once in a fight at the edge of the sandwich trench and spared her life. She's like me. And our paths have crossed often, and she's always my enemy. We didn't talk much. She said it would be child's play to slit my throat, but the world still needed me now that evil was reaching out of the depths. I don't know what she meant by that, but it was the first time I ever heard fear in her voice. The Ronin didn't kill me. She did the same as I had done at the Sandwich Trench. She gave me a tank full of breathing gas and expelled me from a lock into the ocean. The breathing gas had almost run out when an Atlantic ore freighter picked me up. They brought me to the Argentine Basin where an unpleasant meeting with my employer was waiting for me. That's where this whole damn business started.
The ship that this junk dealer foisted off on me didn't offer a lot of comfort. It wasn't particularly agile, but it was lightly armed, and to my surprise, it was watertight. I wasn't in a position to make many demands because I just screwed up a pretty good job. I picked up Perry LaSalle, who was seething with rage, and on his way to see my employer, El Topo. El Topo, the mole, so named because he hides his eyes from the light, except when it comes from the surveillance monitors in his dismal mountain fortress. The mole is a powerful force behind the scenes, and he has access to the most important power centers in Aqua. I was sure that here I'd find out what was really on board that freighter. Entrox has a worldwide monopoly on jump ship manufacturing and technology. Up to now, nobody's been able to explain to me how they managed to accelerate their jump ships, ships as long as 500 meters, to an underwater speed of 500 miles per hour. Among other things, the ships have a so-called dipole drive, an endless chain of series-connected electromagnets that charge the water molecules alternately positive and negative, setting them in rotation. An extensive system of veins offers the attack surface needed to convert the energy of rotation into shear energy. If it weren't for the ships and the network of jump points covering aqua, the world wouldn't go round anywhere near as fast. No wonder El Topo is trying to break Entrox's monopoly. Fast transport, as well as the production of breathing gas and energy, are almost entirely in its hands. If Entrox's boss ever got a notion to close up shop, chaos would rule over Aqua. On the eastern edge of the tornado zone off the coast of South America, the busy anarchos have closed off a rock cave in the continental slope and filled it with Helinox breathing gas. Atacama City, it's called. The dream of every inhabitant of Aqua who yearns to feel solid ground underfoot once in their life. In this chaotic labyrinth of rocks, pipes, and tunnels, I expect to track down most likely in a bar serving cold girls and warm beer. We're on our way to one of the most exciting places in the tornado zone, the stations off Galapagos. Apart from their inventive minds and their unscrupulousness, the inhabitants of the tornado zone have two principal sources of income, harvesting mineral-rich manganese nodules and producing synthetic protein around the sulfur-rich volcanic vents off Galapagos, which reach 350 degrees Celsius. Giant tube worms and mussels contain bacteria that can process sulfur and produce carbohydrates out of carbon dioxide and water. The bacteria, in turn, form nourishment for the mussels, worms, and crabs, which are the most cheaply produced animal proteins. Protein is highly valued and much in demand in aqua. The director of this part of the tornado zone, Ivan King, is a tough customer. He wants higher prices for protein. That's why he's holding a fully laden freighter from Bento's Unlimited here along with the crew. It's my job to change his mind. Neapolis, capital of the Atlantic Federation, home of freedom, democracy, and unfettered money-making. On the eve of the 600th anniversary of the ocean settlement, it's gleaming with spit and polish like the inviting entrance of a whore tank. For me, it's too clean, too safe. You always know what the next day will bring, and the citizens are so content they've completely forgotten they're locked up a thousand meters deep in a gas-filled terrarium. For me, Freedom means more than just the right to inhale all the lavender-scented Helionox I want.
Behind the giant locks in the Strait of Gibraltar hides the greatest collection of human trash in all aqua. Under command of the notorious Captain Sorrow, they are an army of outcasts. Criminals and terrorists hunted all over the world. They meet here to plan raids, piracy, and terrorism. To kill a monster of this size, best thing to do is knock off its head. I'll bet anything Sorrow's band of marauders and cutthroats will scatter over the seven seas if they lose their leader. But it's not just a matter of taking Captain Sorrow prisoner. The entire fortress needs to be knocked out in one stroke. That's about it. Aqua's been liberated from one more legend, the cutthroat Captain Sorrow. Floating Bombay. The people of the clans union from the Arabian Indian sphere primarily care about beautifying their existence. They're masters of rare arts like underwater painting, and they have a thorough understanding of how to raise swarms of shining bioluminescent fungal spores. But it's not just the culture of beauty they've mastered, but also the culture of communication. And when it comes to the clans union and communication, that means trade. Here you find everything from secret dipole drives for fighter drones to the latest weapons and weapons guidance systems. The bazaars of the floating city are bursting with technical achievements from the remotest corners of Aqua. They say that in floating Bombay, you can buy a smuggled weapon before it's even invented. <laughs> I've never heard it denied. The e-channels and e-papers are all talking about one thing, the cataclysmic undersea quakes near the Macquarie Ridge in the southern Indian Ocean. First reports tell of thousands of dead. The jump star was completely destroyed, making immediate assistance impossible. The strange thing is this. They've got a sophisticated warning system, but it wasn't able to predict the catastrophe, and there weren't any aftershocks. Many of the tabloid broadcasts are reporting that strange objects, which could only have come from the surface of the Earth, destroyed the entire station with the effect of a massive bomb. I don't believe it. The surface is dead. Nothing living will ever come down to us, and we're never going up there again. The Star of Bengalia did its best. After the incident with the strange cruiser, every minute counted for getting aid to the victims of the horrific undersea quake. But what had happened? Nobody on the Star of Bengalia had ever seen such a ship. When it was directly over us, we didn't hear anything except a powerful vibration. All of our electronic gear shorted out as if we'd sailed into a powerful magnetic storm. 
Kong Lung had spoken of evil from the depths. It became clear to me that she must have meant what we had here, because it was like nothing I'd ever seen. And whatever it was, it sure hadn't come to preach the gospel of peace. You could look on the Machina Antarctica as a sort of outpost of the tornado zone. Except that here, it isn't lively anarchy that dominates, but rather that dull, problem-solving atmosphere common to all peak-headed technocrats who never look over the edge of their test tubes. Ever since Boris Santiago's mercenaries abducted the ingenious scientist Fritz Rasmussen and put him to work in the manganese nodule fields of the South Pacific, the atmosphere here is drearier and more uncertain than before. The chief scientist, Victor Barnhelm, a melancholy man who puts his faith in technology, is familiar to me only from a few noteworthy interviews in which he gravely predicted the end of gas-breathing humans and the rise of liquid-breathing fishmen. I've heard from El Topo that that crazy Barnhelm has already created a prototype of the liquid-breathing artificial human he calls his Homo Aquaticus. No matter what a civilized man thinks of the amphibian Vincent Lefebvre, he's got a vision. His idea of slotting me in as manager of the famous sex-charged Glow Z on board Santiago's Big Fat Mama was carefully thought out and put through. The crew of the floating fortress needs some diversion, so it seems I'm guaranteed to be received with open arms. Once I'm aboard the mega freighter, I shouldn't find it hard to enter into Santiago's service. That'll let me keep an eye out in peace and quiet for Fritz Rasmussen, who's being held captive. And if need be, I can put Boris Santiago and his whole pompous floating imperial court out of action. In the area of the Cape Verde Rise, all hell is broken loose. An armada of mutinous mock soldiers is threatening the Digastation there. That by itself would be enough reason to get angry, but General Cox is afraid that the rumor is true and a fleet of the Shogun's warships is headed there as well. If so, they'll be entering the territory of the Atlantic Federation for the first time in ages, which would amount to an open declaration of war. The diggers are the pariahs of the world's oceans. Their job consists of digging up the palm layer, that sickening mass of dead organic particles that covers the surface of the ocean. Most importantly, exploitation of these particles produces the much needed nitrogen which fertilizes the farming facilities. The diggers work so close to the surface that they're exposed to high doses of radioactive radiation which is in turn responsible for the frequent appearance of mutations in their ranks. All over Aqua, people disparage the diggers, the mutants, and treat them as lepers. The adherents of the Mok cult want to wipe the diggers out to the last man. In their warped view, the palm layer represents the personification of the god Mok, and every digger harvest is a wound to his divine body. The Shogun government is also in a state of permanent war with the diggers, whom they regard as serious competitors in nitrogen production. Attacks on Digastationen by the Shogun's boats or by bands of monks are a daily occurrence in Aqua. The leader of the Cape Verde diggers is Theodore Brown, a revered, telepathically endowed mutant they call the Great Magician Merlin. At the moment, at any rate, his magical powers are failing in the face of impending military annihilation and a more effective protection seems to be called for. The top command of the Atlantic Federation has sounded a war alarm, and on the monitors of the bridge, we continually receive horrific reports from the Red Sea. The situation has become more desperate. 
The attack of the monarchist troops on the Station of the Cape Verde Rise seems to have been a diversion. The main target of the Shogun government appears to be the Red Sea, which is under the territorial regime of the Clans Union. There are unbelievable natural resources there. Petroleum, diamonds, gold, platinum, and the titanium that's critical for the construction of boats and stations. The first attack wave of the army of the Shogun government is over. Under the command of General Tsui Akira, the monarchists are carrying out a brutal massacre of the protection force of the Atlantic Federation. The monarchists can make life hell for you. Every mistake is fatal. The fighter pilots face a considerable challenge maneuvering in the shallow waters of the strait, and the threat from radioactive surface contamination only makes it that much worse. As if it weren't bad enough that we have to deal with a powerful armada from the Shogun government, now we're in the line of fire of some of the Bayon's cruisers. We're underway to the Mariana Trench, the deepest valley in the world, summoned by a Bayon alarm. The monarchists operate their geothermal power station in the trench, converting magmatic energy from the Earth's interior into electricity. The geology of the Earth's crust is particularly unstable there, and Admiral Voidja Ping suspects the Bayons are trying to exploit this fact to set off an undersea quake. News has come through that the raging battles in the Red Sea have cooled down. An undersea quake of catastrophic magnitude destroyed the stations and habitations of the clans union in the Arabian Sea. No survivors. I've seen it before. The right displacement of the Earth's crust and a powerful tsunami arises, stirring up the sea, sucking the polluted surface layers into the depths. No one can survive. It's becoming clear that these undersea quakes are not just whims of nature. The Ronin Kung Lung called the Bayans evil from the depths. The Moks talked of the growling from the depths. I bet my last credits that they're right. The undersea quakes are being intentionally unleashed. The devil only knows what machines the Bayans have that can mobilize the very crust of the earth against the people of Aqua. like jobs that take me into Shogun territory. Years ago, I supposedly insulted his majesty, and after a rigged trial, I was sent to a penal colony in the Sea of Okhotsk. Thanks to the Ronin Hunglung, I was able to escape. Nobody has ever seen the Shogun Emperor Lung in person, but that simply makes him the most powerful phantom on earth. He is feared, loved, and honored by his subjects, though some are said to be dissidents. It seems to me as if everybody here is in lockstep. For the strong ones, there are only two courses. Climb as high as they can in the officer's corps, or run. The Bayants were clever. Not even our smallest robotic rescue unit can dive that deep. A slightly built man might just be able to squeeze inside, but nobody could breathe down here at a pressure of 1,200 atmospheres. ...to design and build a machine that could take over rescue operations in this abyss. I've got an idea. El Topo has organized the transportation of troops from the Atlantic by jump ship. Floating Bombay was the locus. All available fighting units of the Atlantic Federation, of the Shogun government, and of the Clans Union are on their way to pay their respects to Serbian's bridgehead off the coast of Australia. The scientists suspect that the central guidance unit of the Serbian is in the center of a tube protected by several concentrically arranged rings made of an unknown titanium ceramic alloy. It doesn't look like it'll do any good to destroy the individual protective walls with heavy fire from the plasma cannon. The center, 
The innermost heart is almost certainly secured by separate mechanisms and could probably withstand the blast from an H-bomb. However, if we can set off the seismobomb in the immediate vicinity of the center, there's a chance we can annihilate the Serbian bridgehead. Of course the Bayans have been expecting us. They've formed around their center in several defensive rings. Our ponderous battleships won't have an easy time against the mobility of their units. The plan is clear. Our side must breach the Bayans' defensive rings with smaller fighting ships and try to briefly disable their biomass and electronics with a massive blast of the EMS weapon. If we throw everything we have at them in a blistering assault, our battleships can press forward and engage the heavy Bayant cruisers. They've all come. The Mole under Captain Colosimo, the Shinto One with Admiral Vojja Ping on board, the Star of Bengalia under the command of Yala Ranjun, and the Polar with Captain Lopez and Admiral Peacock. That's the way I'll always remember the brave Ronin, grinning into the heart of hell, carrying with her the most powerful bomb of all time. Amazon, Piratus, Anarchist. The Red Dragon brought the steel heart of the monster to the melting point. The moment she was gone in the shock waves of the raging plasma, I missed her. The mighty shock waves of the exploding bridgehead set our heaviest battleships rocking like helpless jellyfish. Water began to boil from the energy that was released. Water that for fractions of a second took on the consistency of salty gel. It hissed and bubbled, precipitating its mineral components to the bottom of the sea. The gases that had been set free rose in mighty glistening orbs towards the surface. The surface that we certainly would never see. The wild, unknown surface, corroded by poison and radiation, an unattainable paradise of hellish dangers. For some, the epitome of archaic horror. For others, a lighted beacon in an endless quest for lost origin. I gave General Cox a tired salute and signed off. The Triton sailed with the other ships to home waters while I spent a moment in the darkness, listening to the faint echoes of the last battle won. We had destroyed the Servian, at least that part lying beneath the surface of the sea. Our scientists suspect a significant portion of the bridgehead lies on the continent of Australia itself, Perhaps we've met our own future in the Bayans. Perhaps we and they would have learned if there had been any readiness to do so. But when was learning ever long in the mind of any species? <laughs> <laughs>